Perfect. We're really excited to have Mary Schindler on the line today to talk about leadership. And um, she is, and I stole this from your Young Women's Leadership <laughs> website, but she's a professional life coach, a dancing freedom teacher, and a facilitator for Generation Wake Up. And she has over five years of experience as a trainer and facilitator, um, and she's only 24. So that, she is definitely a role model for all of us. Um, her long list of accomplishments includes co-founding the Summer of Solutions in Oakland, uh, which is where you still are, right? Mm -hmm. Living in Oakland. And most recently, uh, she is a co-founder of an organization called Young Women's Leadership, whose mission is to strengthen the solidarity, leadership, and leadership of young women and females worldwide. So, um, Mary, I'll pass it off to you. Awesome. So I'm really excited to be on this call with all of you. It's um, really fun for me to talk about leadership. And I started thinking about what distinguishes people who succeed from those who don't. So I started thinking about that. What are like the traits and characteristics of um, people who we consider leaders? I'm going to jump in and share um, a story, how I got started in this journey of leadership. So this is a photo of me with some other trainers at Generation Waking Up which is the organization I work with out here part-time. I joined the Earth Club at um, my university and I learned about mountaintop removal coal mining. Uh, and the first time that I saw, we went to um, Southwest Virginia, we went to Appalachia, uh, took a trip down there and saw um, coal mining and saw the just absolute destruction of like this bare flat land where a mountain used to be. And I remember looking out across these miles and miles of this bare flat land and um, just being absolutely stunned that this would happen. So that was this moment for me of like waking up, like I have to do something about this. I can't just let this happen and, and sit by and ignore it. So I started organizing after that. That was my sophomore year of college got involved with a ton of different or organizations. I um, helped bring a youth delegation to COP15, um, the climate negotiations in Copenhagen with the Sierra Student Coalition. And uh, got, after a couple of years, that was in 2009, um, got really burnt out and realized that um, this was really not the way to organize, that we need to find a way to sustain and support um, ourselves as we're doing this work so we can really do it for the long haul. And I came across Generation Waking Up and was just like, this is it, like this is the kind of work that I want to be doing, um, leading workshops and trainings that are um, inspiring and empowering and igniting to young people. Since then have been also looking at different models of leadership and different ways to support people um, to be really thriving leaders. So. That's a little bit about my story, and um, Leslie already shared what I do now, but I, I work with this organization, or help to start it, um, and we do trainings for young women and females. But with that, the model that I'd like to share today about leadership is a four-part model. So as I was thinking about this and thinking about leadership, I came across these four different ideas, which is you, um, who you are as a leader, your big vision, what you're creating in the world, um, how you're getting things done, like if you're working, um, like time management, um, productivity, all of that, working in a thriving way, and then your impact, how you're measuring your outcomes of the work that you're doing. And it's kind of, to me, it's a cycle. So if you are um, doing what you love, you've got this great vision that you're enrolling others in, you're really getting things done in a productive way, and you're making an impact, then that's going to support you to continue doing what you love. So that's the model um, that I came across. So starting with you, what holds meaning and value to you? What are your core values and what do you uniquely love to do? When I think about leadership, I think this is a really um, key piece because um, it's what you're doing in the world, but it's also who you're being as you're doing that. Who you're being 
as an organizer um, and as a leader is just as important as what you're doing. To me, leadership is about love <laughs> and not only doing what you love to do, but like the love that you have for your issue or for your um, whatever it is you're working on. So a lot of times we might think that uh, I'm helping to stop fracking or I am helping to like end the violence against women. Um, but really that like what is the deeper place that that's coming from? Like what is, um, why do you want to stop fracking? Well because you value um, a world that has clean water and you know whatever it is um, or why do I want to stop the, in the violence against women? It's because I really value like women feeling safe and I value human beings and I want this to be um, a part of our world. Um, so figuring out like what's below what you're doing can be really helpful to um, discovering what you love and what your purpose is. So I invite you to start thinking about like what is it that you really, not only what you love to do, but what's kind of below the um, a little bit deeper for you in terms of what you're doing now. So a frame that I like to use is the hero's journey and this comes from Joseph Campbell who wrote a book about this and the um, he talks about the individual as on this journey you know that you'll have ups and downs and um, but ultimately like you're on your path in life, like your purpose is to do what is meaningful to you, what you see is needed in the world and what you really love and enjoy doing. One tool that I would love to share is called life's intention. And when we get really clear about like a life's intention, it's like what is, it's like a direction that we're going towards. What is, um, why am I doing this project? Why is this cause important to me? Um, what, you know, what's driving my work and what's behind it? So a life's intention was developed um, by Maria Nemeth in the Academy for Coaching Excellence, which is the coaching school that I went to. And um, it literally it just means like to stretch forth, you know, to, um, if you think about, um, I I love training and facilitating and maybe a life's intention behind that is um, to be a successful communicator. For those of you who can see it now on the screen, um, you can kind of rank your life's intentions one to five. So it might be to be financially successful, to be physically fit and healthy, um, and just rank it like how important is this to me? Um, and you might find that you have a lot of fours and fives, and that's great. And um, or you might find, oh, there's actually like out of this whole list, really the only thing that's important to me is to be a visionary leader. And you know, and then just notice that as well. Um, and what I invite you to do with your projects is to go through this and think about like what is what might be one life's intention that's related to your project. Um, and think about like how how is that driving your project or what where are you getting the energy for for the work that you're doing something to um, that y'all might find as you are developing your projects is that typically rockets so when they take off they use about um, like 90% of their fuel at, at liftoff that's something to keep in mind because when when we bring any idea or goal or dream into reality it's going to take a lot of energy at the beginning and that's just the nature of it um, and it's sometimes helpful to think about physical reality as leaders because it doesn't nest because just because you're hitting some kind of a, a barrier or something doesn't go according to plan doesn't necessarily mean to give up on that goal or turn back. It just means, oh, I'm making this happen in physical reality and things are going to be different or might not be exactly as I had planned. I'd love to share this term monkey mind with you all. So monkey mind is a Buddhist term and it uh, is the nature, it's the part of our mind that kind of swings from doubt to worry to fear and back again. The nature of monkey mind 
uh, it's the part, it's the amygdala of our brain, right? It's the part of our brain that's looking for danger. So it comes up when we are taking some kind of goal or dream from visionary reality and actually taking real steps towards it. So you might have, I have a dream to, for example, um, start a new club on my college campus. I start to take these like very real steps and I might come up with some monkey mind, which is just like, oh no, what if no one shows up to the meeting? What, you know, I don't have enough time to do this, whatever it is. Um, so it's totally normal. It's likely to come up when we're entering physical reality. And the only thing to do with monkey mind is to shift the focus of your attention to what's more interesting. One of the things that you can shift the focus of your attention to is your life's intentions. So maybe uh, have this big goal to start a brand new club on my campus and um, I have all this fear coming up about it. Well, I also have an intention to be a contributor to my community. So I'm able to start to think about, oh, this is really important to me to be a contributor to my community in this way. And I can focus on that instead of focusing on what might go wrong if I start this club. It's really important to have your vision, your goals, and then um, any kind of milestones that are getting to your goals and what is your strategic plan for getting there. Okay, so coming up with a strategy, you're going to have resources, so your time and energy and efforts, what you're putting into your project, the actual process of um, doing the project, then your, um, your outputs, which is like, uh, I organized a leadership training and I trained 10 youth leaders. That would be an output. So what's the outcome? out of the output and the reason why it's really important to think about outcomes is because you always want to be thinking about the why like why am I doing this what's the mission behind it what's the benefit for the world or for my community what are people going to get out of it as leaders think continuing to distinguish between outputs and outcomes is really important because the outputs often we get stuck there we're like oh we trained 50 youth leaders, or we brought together 50 youth leaders. It's great, but like, why, what happened because of that? What did those youth leaders go do in their communities? I just want to offer a couple of little tools that have helped me in being more uh, productive and managing my time better. Because essentially, it's, what it's going to come down to is the things that you're doing every day. We might have a lot of stuff going on at one time, <laughs> need to manage a lot of deadlines, or uh, different projects at once and so it's really important to get really clear about how we're managing our time and how we are working and how we're getting stuff done so um, do one thing every day uh, <laughs> this may seem counterintuitive because you might say well I have 25 things to do today and I can't possibly just do one thing but I guarantee you if you set give yourself a goal, set a goal to just do one thing every single day, um, it's going to make a huge difference because you might start to find that you're actually not even getting one thing done every day. You're just doing a whole bunch of little pieces on all these different things. The 80-20 principle, like 20% of your efforts is going to result in 80% of the results that you want to see. For example, um, I, I want to get 20 people to, um, or a bunch of people to my meeting next week. How do I do that? Well, um, there's a whole bunch of different strategies I could use. I could send emails. I could call people on the phone. I could put up flyers. Um, but thinking about, okay, in the previous time, the last time I sent a whole bunch of emails, no one responded to it. But when I actually called my friends and invited them to the meeting, they all showed up. So that would be like 20%. I need to just spend my 20% of my time calling people and not be putting up flyers or doing this other thing. Finally, um, ignoring your email. Uh, this is a really great <laughs> tip that I got from a book called The 4-Hour Workweek um, by 
Tim Ferriss, and he said, um, don't answer your email before 10 or 11 in the morning. And I started doing this, and it makes a huge difference because I realized how much time I was wasting just like checking email and Facebook. And the last thing is just to um, cultivate some kind of practice for yourself for self-sustainability. So this is really important because um, we have to find the things that really support us to continue doing the work. So for me, I do, I have a yoga practice. I go to yoga or do yoga myself almost every day and I just love it or I go running. So just finding something that really supports you to sustain yourself uh, and putting that into your day and your life as this really important piece of leadership because you need to support yourself and sustain yourself to keep going. Yeah. So I want to stop there. Yes. Thank you well, so thank much, you Mary, so much for Mary, for coming.